हेलो चैम्पियंस एंड वेलकम बैक टू पी डब्ल्यू इंग्लिश एंड आई एम योर दीक्षा शर्मा मैम तो वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट विद द चैप्टर लोकोमोशन एंड मूवमेंट टुडे तो व्हाट अबाउट दिस चैप्टर देर आर वेरी टू इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग्स इन दिस चैप्टर वन इज द मस्कुलर पार्ट एंड सेकेंड इज द स्केलेटल पार्ट तो द फर्स्ट विच इज द मस्कुलर पार्ट इट ऑल टेल्स अबाउट हाउ योर मसल्स वर्क एंड The second part tells you about your skeletal system, your bones in the body. Both these things helps you to move, helps you to you know move your body from one place to another. And this is how the chapter got its name: locomotion and movement. So your musculoskeletal system is a system in your body which comprises of muscles and bones. And this is the one, and this is the reason why we are able to move from one place to another. So I suggest all of you. If you have not covered the types of muscle in the chapter structural organization in animals, first you should go there, study all the types of muscle, and then come back to this chapter. Because you know, if you don't know the different types of muscle, you will not be able to understand the physiology behind this. So let's get started. So as the name is locomotion and movement, so let's see what is locomotion and what is movement. movement is the displacement of a body part like i'm moving my ha- uh, arm or my hands but i am uh, i am located at one place only i'm not moving my entire body but if i started walking from one place to another displacement of the entire body is taking place here so that will be the locomotion so what is the locomotion locomotion means displacement of the entire body loco motion displacement of the entire body and what about the movement the displacement of a body part only displacement of a body part only body part only right so in the entire animal kingdom if we see in the other organisms as well the locomotion and uh, the movement it takes place by different means by different ways right for example if i talk about us our muscles and skeletal system they together are working to move your body from one place to another if i talk about the lower organism like this what is this you all know about this it is paramecium it is paramecium so if i talk about paramecium it has cilia all around the body here it has cilia all around the body and this cilia helps this paramecium to locomote to move from one place to another also the cilia is present in its cytopharynx you can see here it has pharynx through which the food enters so there is a cytopharynx what is this what is this this is cytopharynx and through cytopharynx the food enters right so it wants to engulf this food so for the engulfment of food the cilia is present in the cytopharynx so here the movement of food is taking place but if i talk about the locomotion the paramecium is doing both the things with the same with the same locomotory organ that is cilia the cilia around the body helps it to move from one place to another that is locomotion and if i talk about the movement of food that is again it is taking place with the help of cilia in which the food is moving into its body through the cytopharynx right so paramecium have cilia so cilia helps to locomotion or it helps in locomotion and movement of food movement of food into the cytopharynx all right next is this thing i think you must have seen this if you if not it's a cilian trait i know someone must have guessed it that's hydra what is it it's hydra if i talk about hydra hydra have these long arm like structure you can see here these are tentacles what are these tentacles these tentacles these tentacles in hydra it is also performing both the function just like that of cilia and the paramecium it helps the hydra 
for locomotion and it also helps the hydra to capture the food or prey right so at most of the places the hydra is fixed to the substratum or some rock like structure right substratum is anything it can be a wood or rock or like something like that right so it has some arms and these arms allow the hydra to capture the food which is present around it because it's in water so it is helping it to capture the food otherwise this tentacles also help the hydra to swim so this is how we say it helps in locomotion as well right so if i talk about the organism like us like the higher organism in us the movement is not only take place by muscles and uh, bones but it is it takes place by the common effect of your nervous system your muscles your skeletal system for example i want to move this arm and this was my will so this was my skeletal muscle it was under my control so this is my skeletal muscle which is doing some function so this command is given by my brain and through neuron it is coming to the skeletal muscle and muscles will now contract right so here if i talk about the higher organism all right here if i talk about the higher organisms like us higher vertebrates so three systems are working what are those neural muscle and skeletal all these system they are responsible for locomotion and movement locomotion and movement how let's see if i say this is the brain through this brain the information is coming with the help of some neurons and these neurons are innervating the skeletal muscles now these muscle will contract as a result of which the bone which is present here it will move right so here what we have here we have neuron this is the command center which is the brain and this is the muscle and what is this this is the bone so when a muscle contract the bone is uh, skeletal muscles are attached to the bones the bones have to move there right so basically something has been stick to the for example if this is a bone something is stick here if it is moving the bone has to move just like that right but the command center is usually the brain and the information gets into the skeletal muscle through the neurons or any muscle it can be smooth muscle fine so this is how all these systems are working together as a unit so that it can lead to locomotion and movement okay so let's talk about the types of movement in our body so we just not show only the muscular movement we also show the non muscular movements so let's see what type of these movements are one is the muscular which takes place with the help of muscles and another is non muscular right if i talk about muscular movements the majority of the movement takes place with the help of skeletal muscle because 80% movement is by the skeletal muscle so the uh, smooth muscles are also contracting cardiac muscle is also contracting they are leading to the movement of food and blood you know but the majority of movements it takes place with the help of skeletal muscles so if i talk about non muscular so what are the non muscular movements we have first is the ciliary movement second is pseudopodial or amoeboid and third is flagellar right so ciliary movement definitely here what will be included cilia right so where do we have cilia we have discussed that in the structural organization where do we have cilia we have cilia in our fallopian tubes and in our respiratory tract so what in a respiratory tract the cilia are doing they are leading to the you know propulsion or the movement of mucus and dust particles right sometimes you know if the food gets stuck in the trachea and the trachea you know you started coughing and the trachea and the cilia they will move out that food so here we have two example one is the respiratory tract
and another we have fallopian tube so what is moving inside the fallopian tube ova or egg right so in respiratory tract there is movement of mucus and dust particles and dust whereas in the fallopian tube movement of ova or ova fine let's talk about the amoeboid movement or the pseudopodia why it is known as amoeboid because it function just like that the amoeba moves right so amoeba moves how does amoeba moves it moves with the help of its uh, pseudopodia these projections what do you call it as pseudopodia so one this type of movement it takes place in amoeba but since we are talking about us we are talking about humans so here in us the macrophages and wbcs they show amoeboid movement just like the amoeba does right so here what examples should be there wbcs which are white blood cells and then we have macrophages and now let's talk about flagella now you will say ma'am where does we have flagella we don't have the males have <laughs> in males the sperm is present and sperm has flagella so here we will write the example sperm so apart from the muscular movements we do have non muscular movements and these are of three types ciliary amoeboid or pseudopodial and flagellar let's talk about the structure of a skeletal muscle we have already already discussed all the three types of muscles in the previous chapter so i'm not going to talk about that because i know my students already know it better right so now we will see the structure of a skeletal muscle and also i will explain you the structure of sarcomere here if we have already discussed no problem but i that will be a revision for you because it is really very important here to you know understand those structures otherwise everything will be very difficult for you what is that everything the mechanism of muscle contraction fine so here if i talk about the skeletal muscle i am taking the section of a skeletal muscle what am i doing i am taking the section of a skeletal muscle if i talk about the skeletal muscle it is covered by it is covered by a connective tissue that is epimysium as we have discussed the areola connective tissue it helps us to pack various organs so this is a type of areola connective tissue that covers your muscle and that is epimysium so we are drawing the ts which is a transverse section of skeletal muscle inside the skeletal muscle are present very small small muscle bundles so these are muscle bundles which are again surrounded by a connective tissue each muscle bundle is surrounded by a connective tissue which is perimysium which is perimysium all right so this is the perimysium all these are connective tissues and this entire structure is a muscle bundle or muscle fascicle muscle bundle or muscle fascicle now if it is entire muscle there must not be any empty spaces right here right because you know our body has a very important tissue which is a connective tissue wherever you need packaging they will be right there for example you ordered a box of something like you know any make a product just like that or something which are which is fragile you have seen there is uh, you know if the something is fragile it is wrapped around by certain bubble wraps right so that bubble wraps are helping all those things so that they should not break similarly we also have another bubble wrap here which is allowing all these muscle bundles to pack together so it's present here in the empty spaces this is your fascia so if someone asks you which connective tissue packs all the muscle bundle together that's fascia which is a connective tissue which is present around a single muscle bundle that will be your perimysium this is a difference so fascia it packs all the muscle bundles together muscle bundles together all right so let's make it simple the skeletal muscle is made up of a lot of muscle bundles and muscle bundles are made up of a lot of muscle cell so inside the muscle bundles what will you be having you will be having 
a lot of muscle cells which are also known as muscle fibers so what are these these are muscle cells or muscle fibers right and these muscle fibers have small filament like structure in them what are these small filament like structure these are myofibrils what are these myofibrils these are myofibrils so myofibrils are present inside muscle cell a lot of muscle cells they group together to form a muscle bundle and a lot of muscle bundles they group together to form a muscle so this is the structure of your muscle right i hope uh, you understood this if not just see it again because you know sometimes it gets confusing if it is still not clear let me make another diagram for example if this is a skeletal muscle right inside the skeletal muscle are present a lot of muscle bundles like these fine and inside muscle bundles are present a lot of muscle cells just like this okay and inside the muscle fiber or muscle cell are present the myofibrils like this okay so this is how it is this is the muscle this is the muscle bundle pink one is muscle cell and green one is myofibril and all these are packed together by the connective tissues fine i hope uh, that's clear to everyone let's move further let's move further and talk about the muscle cell or the skeletal muscle cell skeletal muscle cell or fiber so if i talk about the skeletal muscle cell or fiber if this is a muscle cell the the sar the sarcoplasm is present in the skeletal muscle what is a sarcoplasm it's a specialized membrane and this sarcoplasm is you know invaginated at some places like this and forming the structures known as tubules right so if this is your muscle cell one muscle fiber you will see the plasma membrane which you call it as sarcolemma what you call it as sarcolemma this is invaginated and it is forming t tubule right i thought i have uh, uh, you know uh, told you sar sarcoplasm previously that's my bad it's sarcolemma the sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm is the cytoplasm fine so sarcolemma is a plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle cell and sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm all right and these invaginations are known as t tubules and inside them are present the myofibrils so these are myofibrils these are present transversely in a skeletal muscle how are they present they are present transversely like this all right and inside them is present light and dark bands and these light and dark bands are formed by contractile proteins which are actin and myosin right so like this everywhere it will be like this like this okay so what are these these are light bands what are these these are light bands these are light bands the one in the white and the one in the black these are dark bands and these are alternately present okay so these myofibrils what are these these are all our myofibrils these myofibrils are attached to the sarcolemma these are attached to the sarcolemma with the help of certain proteins what are these protein these are dystropin proteins then what is the function of this dystropin proteins you know sometimes while contracting these myofibril may get you know moved from one place to another but we don't want them to move because they are present in a certain arrangement which will lead to the contraction of muscle 
so if they move it will be very difficult for us for the contraction so nature has given us a spring like protein here which is known as this drop in that allows the myofibril to get into the single direction or the same direction similarly these proteins are also present here all right okay apart from this are present very important structure here which are the modified smooth endoplasmic reticulum which is the sarcoplasmic reticulum what are these sarcoplasmic reticulum sarcoplasmic reticulum are modified smooth endoplasmic reticulum and they store calcium ion so what is present inside them calcium ion they are modified smooth endoplasmic reticulum and they stores calcium ion all right so here you will see these thick and uh, uh, these dark and light bands what are they made up of they are made up of as i've told you contractile protein the light bands contain thin filaments what are filaments myofilaments the filaments uh, the myofibril is made up of myofilaments and myofilaments are made up of contractile protein which are actin and myosin fine so when they are present in alternate manner since some are thin and some are thick they will give you the appearance of some somewhat light and dark and hence it forms alternative light and dark bands if i say the light band is made up of thin filaments thin filament contains actin why you call it as thin filament because they appear thin and this one made up of thick filament which is made up of myosin all right we have called them thick or thin on the basis of how they look like whether they look thin whether they look thick and why they are not filaments uh, or myofilaments because they are filamentous like a thread and these are actin and myosin which are contractile proteins fine okay so this was the structure of a skeletal muscle cell or fiber so if you see here is a arrangement of alternative light and dark bands what is it alternative they are present in altern alternation due to this arrangement here comes the formation of the structure which is known as a sarcomere what do you call it as you will call it as a sarcomere if i uh, if i tell you that in between the light band is is the passage of some protein or if i say some proteins are present in a linear manner that they bisect this light band and form this structure which is known as a sarcomere so this entire structure is a sarcomere all right so let's see what is a sarcomere in detail so sarcomere will only be present where alternative light and dark bands are present if i say this is your thin filament this is your thin filament like this alternatively present this is also thin this is also thin this is also thin it may in between them is present your thick filament like this okay so this is how they are forming light dark light bands okay so uh, the z line is present here which is made up of proteins and it bisect your thin filament the z line is present which bisect your thin filament what is a z line it's nothing it's just the proteins right so this is your thin filament thin filament thin filament is made up of three contractile protein actin troponin and tropomyosin yes i have previously told you just one protein because i know you you must have heard of the actin you may not have heard of the another ones so there are basically three proteins contractile proteins fine and then we have this structure which is the thick filament and thick filament is made up of just one contractile protein which is myosin fine so here this structure right from this z line to this z line this is also another z line this structure is one sarcomere and this is a structural and functional unit of skeletal muscle structural and functional all right 
so here is a formation of certain bands depending upon uh, what they are carrying for example if i say i have this small space where you can only see these white lines and these white lines are your thin filament so the areas where there is only thin filaments present you call this area as i band what do you call it as i band right so this will also be your i band where only thin filament is present but the area which contains thin and thick both which contains thin and thick both is your a band is your a band so right from here to here where there is overlapping of thin and thick plus the entire thick this is your what this is your a band but the regions between two thin filament where you will only find the thick filament that is the h zone all right so in between these two thin filament is h zone the area where both thin and thick are present is a band and area where only thin is present is i band so here i means isotropic isotropic band iso means similar so it will contain the filaments which are all same which is similar that's thin filament it contains only thin filament right whereas an isotropy that means which is not same which is not similar that contains both thick and thin filament fine okay so this was the structure of sarcomere and it plays a vital role very important role in muscle contraction how for that you need to understand the structures of the contractile protein so let's see the structure of contractile proteins so we'll start with the primary myofilament what is primary which is very important something which is more important you call it as primary and your primary filament is your thick filament the primary or the thick filament is made up of proteins known as myosin it is made up of made up of myosin protein right sometimes you also call it as meromyosin sometimes you also call it as meromyosin because the single unit is known as meromyosin one thick which you have seen here one thick is made up of one thick filament is made up of 300 myosin protein how much 300 myosin protein. okay and one myosin protein if i talk about just one myosin it is made up of two heavy polypeptide chains that means it's proteinaceous that's why you have call it as protein two heavy polypeptide chains and four light polypeptide chain okay let's see how does it looks like if i say it contains two heavy chains that means these chains will be heavier it will be longer it will be containing more amino acids so let's see how do they look like if this is if this is one polypeptide chain the heavier one it is going upward and rotating backwards now comes another one again it will move like this like this okay so the light chains are present near these portion near these portion as a result the entire body of it gets divided into so many parts what are these this portion is the head this forms the head this portion is the short arm and this entire portion is the tail all right so the portion which contains the short arm and the head you call it as heavy meromyosin based upon its molecular weight so this is heavy meromyosin if someone ask you what heavy meromyosin is made up of you will say short arm and head and what uh, tail contains or the tail is known as the lmm light meromyosin and this is hmm right light meromyosin okay so this is how we say it is made up of two heavy polypeptide chain and four light chain so these are the light chains what are these these are the light chains these green ones and this one is the heavy chain okay 
so this head is very important head is very important so this uh, uh, you you know this head uh, if i talk about this structure these heads are projected outwards like that like that right these are very important these are projected like this because this one thick filament is made up of 300 myosin so their heads will be projected outward and they will be producing cross arm here what will be they producing they will be producing cross arm or this structure is known as a cross arm because it's like a arm which is going to attach to this filament so this structure is known as a cross arm because it is going to attach to the thin filament okay so this as i've told you this head is very important why it is important the myosin head the myosin head it contains it contains atp binding site what is atp the energy currency and the one which has currency that's more important that's why you call it as the primary myofilament to this actin binds right as i've told you this head will bind to the thin filament and thin filament is made up of actin so it's quite clear during contraction the myosin will bind to the actin fine so here it has the actin binding site it's the place on the myosin head to which the actin binds so we say it has actin binding site also it act as atpase enzyme what is atpase ATPase is an enzyme which convert the ATP into ADP plus IP that means releasing the energy right so actin is will will always be present on its place what will move head will always move because head has the currency it has the you know uh, it has that uh, capacity or it has the atp and atpase which will dis which will dissociate the atp and give you energy so that's why the head has to move and bind to the actin all right okay moving further to the next contractile protein which is the thin filament containing actin thin filament thin filament is made up of three protein actin troponin and tropomyosin tropomyosin okay so actin is it's filamentous that means it will be like threads but it is made up of small ball like globular protein which is known as g actin right so if i have this structure which is a g actin it's a single monomer globular uh, protein which contain myosin binding site because you know these actin and myosin they are lovers they are what they are lovers i'll tell you their love story valentine's week so love story should be there right <laughs> so this g actin it contains its actin's monomer it is a monomer of actin and it contains myosin binding site fine so this g actin in the presence of magnesium ions it will polymerize and it will form the f actin it will form the f actin just like this okay so these are small small g actins forming a thread like protein which is the f actin f means fibrous and g means globular so how this thin filament it is made up of if i say this structure is filamentous and it's helical yes this structure is helical it uh, it depicts the secondary structure of protein which is a helical structure so it is just not helical it's double helical that means it will be containing two chains like in this manner so this is your actin i'm making the thin filament guys right so uh, listen to me carefully so this is how the thin filament is fine a uh, thin filament has a base of double helical structure which is the f actin and above this is present again double helical tropomyosin it is also double helical tropomyosin fine on the tropomyosin are present 
troponin and troponin are of three types how many types three types troponin i troponin c and troponin t and troponin t the troponin t will bind to the tropomyosin this is troponin t right whereas troponin i troponin i will bind to the myosin binding site if this is the myosin binding site on the g actin it will bind it here right whereas troponin c is it is present here so this is troponin c this is troponin i and this is troponin t troponin c binds to calcium ions you must have heard the calcium ions are important in muscle contraction troponin t it binds to tropomyosin that's why it's troponin t there are lot of in the intervals right and whereas troponin i is the inhibitory one because it is present it is present on the myosin binding site and it is actually inhibiting the union of two lovers which is myosin and actin fine so here the myosin and actin they both want to join so they both have a place in their heart and what is that heart myosin's heart have actin binding site and actin's heart have myosin binding site so but here there is a villain which is troponin i and that troponin i is masking the myosin binding site on actin so that myosin should not bind to it fine so this is the structure of the thin filament so remember the actin is double helical whereas tropomyosin is also double helical fine and helical means the structure of protein double means there are two strands all right so that's the structure of thin filament so before stepping into how the muscle contracts and uh, and you know knowing about their love story let's solve some questions first okay the light bands contain actin and is called i band a band h zone and z line you have to tell what is present in your light band in light band is present your yes thin filament right it is where what it is present the light band contains actin and it is known as the i band right in a band we have both thick and thin so it does not form the uh, thin uh, the light band whereas h zone uh, contains the thick filament so it might form the dark band where z line is a line that bisects the thin filament so answer will be a fine next each organized skeletal muscle in our body is made up of a number of muscle bundles or fascicles held together by a common collagenous collective tissue layer called so it is asking about all the muscle bundles right so if it is asking about all the muscle bundles all the muscle bundles are packed together with the help of a connective tissue because it's a reola connective tissue it will be rich in a lot of collagen fiber and what it is known as it is known as fascia so answer is c it is talking about this one this one okay this one the one it is present in between the fascicles all right moving towards the next question fusiform uninucleate and involuntary are the features of you know why i have put this question so that i should know that my kids these champions have already read these three muscles which i have told you in the starting of this chapter fusiform uninucleate and involuntary are smooth muscle or visceral muscle so both a and b answer is what is fusiform like this uninucleate it has one nucleus and involuntary that means it is not under your control so answer is d in the resting state a subunit of dash mask the actin binding site for myosin on the actin filament so when a muscle is not contracting some one subunit is masking the active binding site for myosin on the actin filaments that means the myosin binding sites on the actin filaments are masked by what is a villain who was a villain the troponin and which troponin troponin i so answer is b all right okay next the heavy myosin is made up of the heavy is made up of you know guys we have done it here 
the heavy is made up of the head and the short arm so mark the question its answer it's quite simple you know it already the short arm and the head which forms heavy myosin so answer is c where is light myosin is formed by tail only all right simple these type of questions are there you you can crack it if you have understood these uh, concept clearly it will be quite simple for you all right moving further to the next the mechanism of muscle contraction okay so you must have seen this structure in the ncrt i've just placed it here so that uh, you know you get the idea about these so that you should not confuse ma'am the structure in ncrt is different you have drawn it different it's not like that come on right this is the structure of myosin it's the tail this is the short arm and this is the head and this one forms the cross arm okay here we have atp binding site and actin binding site on the heads this is the thin filament these are actin these rope like are tropomyosin and these three units are troponin fine simple the same fine so let's see how the muscle contract for the contraction of muscle there must be a stimulus as i've told you as i've told you the muscle will only contract when the neuron will come and let it know it's time to contract so that means somewhere there is a communication between neuron and a muscle and that communication junction is known as neuromuscular junction so as we have discussed there is a uh, there is a junction called synapse the synapse is a junction that is present between two neurons similarly there is a junction between a neuron and a muscle what do you call it as you call it as neuromuscular junction so what is a neuromuscular junction the junction between a neuron and muscle and muscle all right so we have this uh, skeletal muscle okay it contains a lot of fibers obviously if it is a muscle it will contain a lot of fibers one motor neuron which neuron motor because motor neurons enters into the muscles right whereas sensory neurons they are innervated with the sensory receptors for example uh, as we have discussed there are three types of uh, neurons afferent neuron efferent right sensory or motor so here the information is coming from the cns so what neuron it will be the motor neuron okay so this motor neuron one motor neuron when innervates a lot of muscle fiber this entire structure is known as a motor unit what you call it as motor unit so what motor unit contains it contains number of muscle fibers and one motor neuron one motor neuron so what is a motor unit boys and girls when one motor neuron is innervated by a, or we can say when number of muscle fibers are innervated by one motor neuron we have one motor neuron on the number of the muscle fiber this is a motor unit right so here we will write number of muscle fibers muscle fibers innervated by one motor neuron one motor okay now now what is the neuromuscular junction we have one neuron and here we have the muscle which is a skeletal muscle so this structure is your neuromuscular junction and this is also known as motor end plate motor end plate or neuromuscular junction okay so here we have the structure which is a sarcolemma what is the structure the sarcolemma the plasma membrane of skeletal muscle and now what will be this part of your um, neuron this will be the axonal ends or end bulbs and these end bulbs what they will be carrying they will be con containing a lot of synaptic vesicles and these synaptic vesicle they carry neurotransmitter what do they carry they carry neurotransmitter what are these sac like structures these are synaptic vesicles 
these are synaptic vesicles right so now what happened how do the brain send the signal to muscle as i've told you through neurons and how do neurons they carry signal in the form of nerve impulse which is the electrical excitation right so what is a nerve impulse nerve impulse is the electrical excitation of your neuron just like you know the uh, electric wires you have fine for example there is a simple idea you must have fan in your houses so when i switch on the button imagine the button is your brain and through wire the electrical impulse is going into the fan and fan is a muscle and it is rotating fine so this is how your muscles work fine so here the nerve impulse will arise what is nerve impulse the electrical excitation when the nerve impulse arrives you know some of the channels get open here now what are these channels these are ion channels since your uh, since all the ions cannot directly diffuse from the plasma membrane because they are not uh, like that of lipid so they need to have certain gates through which these ions can pass so these are your ion channels what do you call them as these are ion channels so here which channel we have we have calcium ion channel so when the nerve impulse when the nerve impulse comes here these ion channels will open and the calcium from outside will enter inside and calcium is very much important here why because when the calcium enters here the synaptic vesicles will burst it will fuse here and it will burst releasing the neurotransmitter in this space and this space is known as synaptic cleft what is this space synaptic cleft i'm repeating it one more time the nerve impulse the electrical excitation will come ion channel open calcium ion enter fuses with the synaptic vesicle synaptic vesicle will burst and it will you know release all its neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft which is this area now what is a neurotransmitter as we have already discussed this in the nervous tissue these are certain chemicals like proteins it can be proteins it can be steroids as well so these are certain chemicals they are important for transfer of information now these chemical they will bind to another channels which are present on your sarcolemma since they will bind to these these are like key to the lock and the lock will open which leads to the entry of sodium ions fine here the electrical excitation has opened this channel for calcium and calcium enters similarly here this neurotransmitter will open the sodium ion channels and the sodium will enter inside the cytoplasm of the muscle so when the sodium ions enter the muscles uh, get excited excitation of muscle fine due to this excitation of the muscle the sarcoplasmic reticulum will open and as you know it contains a lot of calcium ion they will release calcium into the cytoplasm what is this this is cytoplasm which is known as sarcoplasm as the calcium ion concentration increases inside the cytoplasm and now comes the love story of actin and myosin so let's see now what will happen here now what will happen here we have the structure this is actin this is tropomyosin and this is troponin one has it binds here another binds to this site and the troponin c which is present here fine so what do we have here when the calcium ion binds to troponin c this is troponin c this troponin c will move in another direction like this it is going to move in this direction and all these troponin they are bound to each other this is c this is t this is i when it will move to in this direction it will lead to the movement of others like this there will be movement of the troponin i as well 
and hence what it was doing it was masking it was you know covering the myosin binding site on actin this will now uncover this site this will now uncover this site and now myosin when it sees oh my god my site is uncovered it has been unmasked it will bind to the actin fine for example if this is the actin this is the troponin i like this when the calcium binds here it will lead to the movement of troponin i like this and now if this is a myosin head like this was troponin i it has been unmasked now this is the myosin binding site the myosin head will bind like fine so this is what happen when a neuronal signal enters into the muscle and these two they bind these two lovers they bind now let's see what happen when they bind how do the muscle contract so now let's see how the muscle contraction actually takes place so let's just have a quick revision first we have these uh, uh, thin filaments and thin filaments we have actin we have two them and then we have troponin so when the calcium binds to troponin c the troponin c will move as a result it will unmask this site which site the myosin binding site on the actin what happened here calcium binds binds troponin c troponin c moves troponin i will move and you know troponin i was inhibitory one it was a villain in the love story of actin and now this will be cause the unmasking of myosin binding site and binding site. now what will happen so the next thing is explained with the help of a theory which is the sliding filament theory. So it's a very important which explains how the muscle contract very beautifully so now what happened now what happened your uh, masking sites are have been unmasked right the troponin i it has been removed by the troponin c now as this has been exposed if this is the myosin binding site and this is troponin i when the calcium binds it will take away the troponin i and now myosin head is ready to take off right now as you can see here if this is your thin filament and this is your thick filament and thick filament's head is just present like this and forming a cross arm so when everything that we were discussing masking sites the myosin binding sites has been unmasked now what will happen this this head it has atp binding site and it can also break atp pnip now what will happen there is dissociation of p and ip right so when the ip get released it is going to give energy to head when it is released it is going to give energy to head as a result the head will move up and bind to thin filament this is the thin filament and this is the thick filament now what is happening the cross bridge formation this cross bridge it is acting as a bridge between thin and thick filament the head is forming uh, the bridge between thick and thin filament by using the atp it is going to move upward like this now what will happen when the adp releases when the adp releases the head will wobble it will move the head will move head will move and leading to the sliding of the thin film and this is known as power stroke it's very simple see these two lovers were away why because troponin i was there when the troponin i it gets removed the head will now use the atp and get attached to this when it will remove its adp as well the head will change its conformation which leads to sliding of both the filament right head straight on lose the atp it's attached the adp gets removed the head will uh, slide past the thick filament right so this is what power stroke is what it happened when adp was fine 
and this is going to move in towards inwards when if you see the sarcomere have seen the sarcomere yes you have sarcomere we have drawn here so whenever the contraction takes place whenever the contraction takes place everything is going to move right in, in inwards so you know when it is going to relax when it is going to relax the new atp will come so when the new atp is added the head gets detached head get you can see there is attachment you can see there is detachment so when it is moving from detachment to attachment it has to take a one atp so when the atp binds to head this leads to attachment right so when is the attachment occurs attachment is occurring when there is yes when there is the dissociation of atp in and right all right moving further so this was the sliding filament theory next you can see here you know, uh the relaxed sarcomere the contracting state of sarcomere and then the maximum contraction when you see here when it is uh, you know relaxed at this point you you can easily uh, visualize the h zone we visualize the i band a band everything is there that we have drawn when it starts contracting when it starts contracting you know it is going to move in when it is moving inwards and both the filaments are passing upon each other during maximum contraction the a band will remain there but i band will disappear as you can see here this portion this portion is i band right and this portion is a this is a band and this is i band when you can see there is maximum contraction no i band is remaining right i bands completely get disappear also you can see the h zones are there but here no. there so we say that during maximum contraction i band and h zone disappear also a band remains constant band remain also all the filaments they are just passing upon each other then they the length has not been reduced the length of filaments remain constant length of myofilament remain constant right okay so this was how your muscle contract let's move further to the next one which is types of muscle fiber so here i'm talking about the types of skeletal muscle fiber i'm talking about skeletal muscle we have two types of skeletal muscle fibers one are the red muscle fibers and another are the white muscle okay so somewhere in your body you will find the red ones and somewhere you will find the white ones the red ones are aerobic muscle fibers because they respire aerobically the presence of oxygen whereas these are anaerobic they respire in the absence of oxygen the red one if i talk about the red one if i talk about the concentration of myoglobin blood vessel or blood supply blood vessel or blood supply i will see that or you will find out that in red it more so the myoglobin the uh, blood supply it's more so that's why it appears right now what is this myoglobin like in blood we have hemoglobin just like that in the uh, muscles we have our respiratory pigment which stores oxygen that is myoglobin and here it is low in here low next is sarcoplasmic reticulum when sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium ion calcium whatever is having calcium appears white the so white fibers will be having more sarcoplasmic reticulum whereas these have less. so if i talk about the oxidation they respire aerobically and they respire anaerobically so where do you find the red one in your back muscle 
these muscles they do not get fatigue whereas the white one they get fatigue they get fatigue and where do you find it in your eyeball eyeball muscle right the flight muscles of the migratory birds you know what are migratory birds the birds that migrate from one place to another like from south pole to north pole depending upon seasons right so here migratory birds have red muscle whereas like pigeon or sparrow they have the fine so that's the difference between red and the white muscle fibers let's talk about the disorders or the diseases associated with it so we are going to discuss a very very important disorders or diseases there are three disorders which you have to memorize one is myasthenia gravis one is myasthenia second is muscular dystrophy and third one is tetanus let's talk about myasthenia gravis the myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder and what is an autoimmune disorder the disorder in which your immunity the your immunity starts killing your own cell so which cell is the one which is getting destroyed here here these sodium ion channels which channels sodium ion channels these are getting destroyed in this neuromuscular junction whenever the nerve impulse comes the neurotransmitter gets released and these neurotransmitters what are these neurotransmitters like ach acetylcholine these are going to get attached to right for example if this is acetylcholine so when acetylcholine binds to the sodium ion channel the sodium ion channel open and entry of sodium ion takes place leading to the excitation of the muscle but what if there is no ach but at the place of ach some antibodies attached here so when the antibodies are formed against ach receptors of these sodium ion channels this leads to muscle wasting because no excitation is going to take place and muscle will not contract and muscle will get wasted or it will causes the paralysis right so what happen in this disorder yes the autoimmune it is autoimmune because antibodies are formed against ach receptors of your sodium ion channel leads to muscle paralysis now what is muscular dystrophy remember the dystrophin protein that binds or holds the myofibrils to the plasma membrane so this muscular dystrophy in this it is a genetic disorder and the protein dystrophin it is not formed so in this no dystrophin protein is formed no dystrophin protein is formed as a result you know whenever the contraction will take place myofibril it will move and it will not come back to its original position which will lead to muscle wasting paralysis so again here muscle paralysis next is tetanus tetanus can occur due to a lot of you know other reasons what actually tetanus is it is rapid spasm of muscle that means your muscle is contracting and contracting there is you know no stop to it it is contracting regularly so that is rapid spasm what is rapid spasm uncontrolled contraction fine now there can be different different reasons of it so one condition that is constant whatsoever the reason is that either inside the muscle cell there is higher calcium ions right the first reason is inside the muscle cell which cell is this muscle cell there is high concentration of the calcium ion or outside the muscle cell in this fluid which is ecf extracellular fluid 
is low concentration of calcium. If any of the situation occurs, whatsoever the reason is, whether it's due to bacteria, whether it's due to hormones or normally, the muscle will control, the muscle, sorry, the muscle will contract in a rapid spasm manner, right? So, any of this reason, if the calcium ion inside the muscle cell is higher or outside the muscle cell, the calcium ions are lower, it will lead to tetany condition or uncontrolled spasm of it, right? So, these are the three disorders related with the muscles. Moving further, the human skeletal. Okay, guys. So, let's talk about this. In human skeleton, if we talk about embryo, the embryo have 300 bones or more than that. But in adult, we have 206 bones. The entire skeleton is divided into two, the axial and appendicular. Fine. So, this is your axial, which is present in the main axis of the body. This one. This is your axial. All right. This also this rib cage. This is your axial skeleton. All right. This is axial. And whatsoever present is laterally is your appendicular. So in appendicular, we have 126 bones. And also we have in axial 80 bones. If I talk about appendicular, one thing that we have is girdles, pectoral and pelvic. In pectoral, we have uh, one scapula and uh, so now we will discuss about your skeletal system. If I talk about the skeletal system in human, in embryos we have more than 300 bones. In adults we have 206 bones and these entire bones are divided into two parts. One is the axial skeleton and another is the appendicular. If I talk about the axial skeleton, it comprises of 80 bones and this skeleton is present in the main axis. So this is highlighted, right? So, this is your main axis. So, it comprises of the number of bones like skull, the one in which your face and, you know, your brain has been enclosed. Then you have hyoid bone, ear ossicle, sternum, ribs and vertebral column. These are the number of bones uh, of which they are made up of. Next, we have girdles. There are two types of girdle. The upper girdle is pectoral, which is made up of two scapulae and two clavicle bones. And the pelvic is formed of two hip or coxal bones, right? So, appendicular also contains the majority portion of bones which comprise of your limbs. So, these are your limbs. So, your appendicular is present laterally in which we have girdles for support. And in these girdles are attached your limbs. We have four limbs and hind limbs, right? So, two four limbs and two hind limbs. This is not F-O-U-R, it's F-O-R-E. So, here... 30 bones, 30 bones, again in two limbs we have 30 and 30 bone. That forms your 120. So, how this 120 is there? We have how many limbs? We have four limbs and each limb have 30 bones. So, that forms around 120 bones. And 80 plus 126, it forms 206 bones in us. So, if I talk about the axial skeleton, uh, before talking about the skull, I will discuss two simple bones here. One is the hyoid bone. Hyoid bone is a U-shaped bone. It is a U-shaped bone. It is a U-shaped bone. And this bone is present below the tongue. It is present below the trunk. It is a single bone. And it do not form any joint with any bone. It is only single. And you know, it's literally single. It is not forming any articulation or joint with the another ones. If I talk about the ear ossicles, these are the bones which are present in your ear. How many ear do we have? We have two ears. Right? So, each ear contains three bones. So, total is like six. Or we can say we have total three pairs of ear ossicle. In each ear... In each ear, we have malus, incus, and stapes. So, what is the shape of these bones? Malus is your hammer shaped. I'm writing shape here hammer shaped. Incus is anvil shape. And stapes is stirrup shape. Right? So, these are these bones. And now, let's talk about the skull. If I talk about the skull, skull is formed of two things. One is the cranial bones, another are the facial bones. 
cranial bones are the one which are enclosing your brain so hence it is known as cranium and brain box as well whereas the one which is forming your face is your facial bones so total we have eight cranial bones and 14 facial bones what are the names let's see frontal parietal temporal sphenoid occipital and ethmoid so i have a mnemonic for you you can uh, learn the names of all the all the bones from that mnemonic few people try spending every option every option and then in the facial one you can see we have a number of bones vomer nasal concave nasal mandible maxillae palatine zygomatic and lacrimal so here how can you uh, remember this webhav can not make my pet zebra laugh so this is how you can learn the names of all the bones right but about the numbers remember most of the cranial bones are single and most of the facial bones are double right so here you have to remember which one is double parietal and temporal and which uh, in the facial the single one are vomer and mandible right so let's uh, make more sense and see where are they located with the help of a diagram so i have a diagram for you here so if you can see here this entire portion is your cranium which comprises of the brain box and it is formed of all your uh, cranial bones so let's make it simple you have your brain so uh, wherever i touch you have to touch it with me your right okay so this one is my frontal which is forming my forehead and this one is my temporals you say this is temples and when you press it you feel good so these are the temples so it's a temporal bone here fine here and uh, in this portion it is a parietal one and at the back before the neck starts is your occipital bone fine so here where is then sphenoid just in between the frontal and temporal is your sphenoid just here this is sphenoid this is temporal all right so if i talk about the occipital bone this occipital bone have something special than the others occipital bone occipital bone have the opening if this is the occipital bone and this is your neck it has one small hole like structure which you call it as foramen magnum and through foramen magnum the spinal cord passes spinal cord passes from here right and then it also have two small projections these are bony projections and you call it as occipital condyles so any skull which has two occipital condyle it is known as dicondylic skull right there are two occipital condyles right guys so this skull is a dicondylic skull and there are certain organism like reptiles they have only one occipital condyle so their skull is monocondylic fine and then if i talk about the sphenoid bone which is here it's a single bone now you will say ma'am it's present on the side and why it's single why it's not two it is present just like this it's a single bone it is so large yeah, that some part of it you can visualize from here and some from here you can easily see it here and here because it's a large bone present just in the middle and in this sphenoid bone in this sphenoid bone a cavity is present in sphenoid bone a cavity is present known as cella turcica known as cella turcica and in cella turcica it is a seat of pituitary gland you must have heard of pituitary gland so pituitary gland is present in a cavity known as cella turcica and that cavity is present in your yes it's present in your sphenoid bone next we have the one bone which uh, still you you can't see this in the diagram because it is present inside the skull that's your ethmoid talking about the parietal bones where are the parietal uh, sorry uh, facial bones where are these so okay first we'll talk about the simple ones mandible this is my mandible the lower jaw the upper jaw this is my maxillae 
here these one touch here the one which are forming my jaw uh, this uh, cheekbone is my zygomatic which is this this is zygomatic now this one is my nasal and nasal concave we have discussed them in the breathing and exchange in the nose you can see them there and then what are left palatine just take your tongue and touch it on the roof of your uh, buccal cavity that's the palate and you will feel it that's hard and that's your palatine bone fine vomer and ethmoid they are present inside of the skull below the, your nose so you just can't visualize from here lacrimal is present inside ear like this near the lacrimal gland fine so that's the location of your all the skull bones guys all right so here what we have we have the uh, these facial bones and here we have the uh, cranial bones moving further to the next is sternum how many sternum we have one and you call it as a breast bone because it is in the female it is present just between the breast so whatever you feel here whatever you feel here this depression like this is your this is the part of your sternum this is the place which you feel and this is known as supra external notch and this is a clavicular notch in which the clavicle clavicular clavicular notch on which the clavicles attach so if you touch it here you can feel this bone this is a beauty bone that's your clavicle which goes like this right so here what do we have clavicles these are clavicles so same way the clavicles are also attached here okay then this is a place where your first rib attach this is a place where your first rib attach So likewise we have facets for all the ribs. So here you will find second rib then third fourth fifth sixth and seventh right and then seventh all right like this okay so how many ribs do we have first of all let's talk about how many ribs do we have ribs are flat bones they are total 12 pairs and these 12 pairs are divided into three types first are your true ribs second are your false ribs and then we have floating ribs so what are true ribs these are the ribs which are attached to the sternum right so when we have discussed the rib cage in the breathing and exchange of gases i have told you that your rib cage is formed of ribs sternum and vertebral column so your ribs are present laterally posteriorly they are attached to thoracic vertebrae and uh, here at the front they are attached to the sternum so the ribs all these three type of ribs they are attached to thoracic vertebrae posteriorly but the difference is in the attachment of your sternum so some ribs they are attached to sternum some are not attached to sternum but they are attached to the cartilage and these are not attached at all fine so if i talk about here i have first second third fourth fifth sixth and seventh pairs of ribs which are directly attached to the sternum with the cartilage with what with the cartilage and what's the name of this cartilage the name of this cartilage is costal cartilage what's the name costal cartilage so these are true ribs these are what these are true ribs because they are attached here to the sternum and posteriorly to the vertebrae so you also call it as vertebro sternal ribs how many are these first seven pairs whereas falls are the one posteriorly they are attached to vertebrae so you will call it as vertebro but uh, in front they are attached to the cartilage so you will call it as vertebro chondral ribs okay 
now which cartilage so here we have these seven pair seventh pair right here we have seventh pair of rib and as you know it is attached to the cartilage here with the sternum right so the eighth so the eighth ninth and tenth they are directly attached to these cartilage but not directly to the sternum so eighth ninth uh, and tenth pair of ribs they are posteriorly attached to the thoracic vertebrae but here anteriorly they are attached to the cartilage of not the sternum cartilage of the seventh rib right so uh, this is how you call them as the uh, false ribs but then we have the 11th and 12th 11th and 12th they are not attached anteriorly to anything but posteriorly they are attached to the thoracic vertebrae so this is how we have this classification wherein the false they are vertebrochondral and floating are vertebral okay vertebral okay so let's write them up these are first seven these are eight nine and ten and these are eleven and 12 pair of ribs so these are the ribs they are posteriorly attached to thoracic vertebrae and anteriorly to sternum and these are posteriorly attached to thoracic vertebrae anteriorly to seventh anteriorly to the cartilage of seventh rib that's why their name is vertebrochondral the chondra word is used for cartilage and here the floating one posteriorly to thoracic vertebrae only So, if you see the structure of thoracic, uh, the ribs carefully, you will see they are somewhat flat bones and they are little curved. Fine. This end, if you see this end, it feels like it has two heads. So, we say our human ribs, they are bicephalic. Bi means two and cephalo matlab. Cephalo means head. Bi means two and cephalo means head fine so it feels like they have two heads so we call our ribs at bicephalic and here what do we have this end it attached to vertebrae and this end attached to sternum or whatsoever depending upon the type of vertebra but since it appears like it has two heads so we call it as it has uh, it is bicephalic all right moving further to next we have vertebral column so you must have seen this uh, type of a structure or a footage or you know diagram of anything like that in the hospitals of spine and injury or any type of a hospital so you will see this structure vertebral column is your backbone it supports your body so what's its common name its common name is backbone its common name is backbone what is it function it supports the body it is one more important function in the vertebral column is present a hollow cavity if i see inside of it i will see the hollow cavity to which the spinal cord runs right understood so inside the vertebral column is present a hollow cavity and that is known as neural canal and through that uh, hollow cavity the spinal cord passes or the spinal cord is present in that hollow cavity so spinal cord is present in a hollow cavity called neural canal present inside vertebral column present inside the vertebral column fine so these vertebral column uh, or this vertebral column is made up of very small small bones now what are these bones these are known as vertebrae they are irregular shaped bones which are vertebrae 
So if you clearly see or closely see the vertebral column, if you ever get the chance, like if you are doing MBBS or something like that, so you will see that these all bones are stacked upon each other, right? But if you are putting two bones together, they are going to have a lot of friction and they are going to, you know, rub against each other and going to destroy all the salts on it. So nature has given the cushion in between them, which you call them as intervertebral disc. So whenever this disc gets dislocated somewhere left or right, the person gets a disorder or disease or something like that, which is known as the slip disc. You must have heard it. Someone has got slip disc by slipping off from the washroom or something like that or during accidents. Fine. So here it is made up of the vertebral column is made up of two things. One is vertebrae. What are vertebrae? irregular shaped bones and the disc in between them which is intervertebral disc right so if i have these two bones vertebrae i'm just drawing it roughly in between them is present a cushiony intervertebral disc and this is rich of white fibrous cartilage it contains white fibrous cartilage. All right. So, if I talk about the types of vertebrae, as you can see here, we have cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and in pelvic, we have two type of cartilage here: sacral and coccyx. All right. So, we have seven cervical. 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 1 sacral and 1 coccyx. That becomes 26. So, these are the total your uh, vertebrae. And you can see the vertebral column is never straight. It's little curvy. Fine. So, that's the various bones present in them. The most important bones that you have to discuss are the C1 and C2. So, your C1 is, that means cervical 1. And your axis is C2, that is cervical 2. So, C1 is also known as atlas and axis is C2. If I say these are present in your neck and uh, the first vertebral or vertebrae is your atlas. So, I can see here the atlas is supporting your in entire skull, right? So, this is how it got its name atlas because in the mythology, atlas was a person who is, you know, taking all the earth on its shoulders. So, so this atlas is also taking the entire weight of your skull here. So, the first one is atlas and second is axis. So, there is a joint between atlas and axis and then there is a joint between atlas and occipital condyles that we have done in the skull so here we have atlas atlas is forming two joints here with the occipital condyles so occipital condyles they get fixed here here right and this is how they are forming the joint whereas atlas is also uh, forming joint with the axis axis have this structure known as dense or peg so this dense or peg gets attached here, here, right? So here, axis is forming two joint, one with the occipital condyle, another with the axis. So this joint help us you to say yes. So you call it as yes bone. This joint help us to say you no. So this is a no bone. For example, if I am moving my head like this, this is because I have a joint between occipital condyle and atlas. I am saying no because I have a joint between axis and the atlas. Fine. All right. So this was about the first two cervical vertebrae. Let's move further and talk about the pectoral girdle. The pectoral girdle is made up of two bones. One is scapulae. Scapulae is also known as shoulder blade. And another we have clavicle. Another we have clavicle. Clavicle is also known as beauty bone or collar bone. Why it is known as a beauty bone? Please let me know in the comments. I will love to see what you know, right? Okay, so scapula is a shoulder blade. It's a triangular bone like this, like this. And here, 
this bone is present just right here here all right and it has a spine which you can feel when you move your uh, shoulder like this you can feel here so this structure is spine and uh, and outwardly it forms a round structure which is known as acromion acromion forms joint with clavicle joint with clavicle right this clavicle and then we have here small depression what do you call it as you call it as glenoid cavity glenoid cavity is a cavity glenoid cavity is a cavity on which a joint forms and that's a joint between your this bone first bone here humerus so this bone is your humerus so humerus you can move your uh, you know arm like this this is due to a joint known as ball and socket joint fine so here a joint is formed between your humerus this is humerus and the glenoid cavity and this is the type of a ball and socket joint uh, sorry ball and socket joint so glenoid cavity it forms a joint with humerus all right if i talk about clavicle it's an s shaped bone like this <coughs> like this so one end of this is attached to the sternum as we have already discussed so this end is a sternal end and one end is attached to acromion the one which is this so this is acromial end all right so these two bones they form your pectoral girdle so in pectoral girdle we have two scapulae and two clavicle so if someone ask you the pectoral girdle is made up of you will say two scapulae and two clavicle all right next we have pelvic girdle so the pelvic girdle is simple it is made up of two hip bones the hip bone is also known as coxal or innominate bone so we have two hip bones because we have two hips and each hip bone is made up of each hip bone is made up of fusion of three bones and these are ilium ischium and pubis all right so i'm just going to draw this bone in a very simple diagram so that it will be more you know make sense to you so if i talk about this bone it looks like this okay so it is formed by the fusion of three bones so if i have here ilium then i have pubis here and then i have ischium okay so this is how one bone is placed here where these three bones are fusing which at which is the point where all these three bones are meeting this point this point is known as acetabulum like in scapula you had the glenoid cavity in which the head of humerus this humerus head was fitting and forming a ball and socket joint just like that here also the head of your thigh bone which is femur gets fit the head of thigh bone gets fit here right and what is a thigh bone femur all right okay so you can see here this uh, pelvic girdle is formed of two hip bone but a lot of other things are forming the pelvis what is a pelvis this lower region where all your organs are present so here it is a sacrum which is your vertebral uh, vertebrae and here we have this two hip bones so at this point the hip bones fuses and this point is known as pubic symphysis so ventrally ventrally where two hip bones fuses that point is known as pubic symphysis and it is rich in white fibrous cartilage white fibrous cartilage all right okay so this was about the pelvic girdle moving further to the forelimb so the forelimb is formed of a number of bones first we have the arm upper arm that is formed of humerus so this is the head of humerus the head of humerus gets fits in it get fits in the glenoid cavity of your scapula and then we have these two bones radius and the ulna the bones of the forearm and then we have in the wrist what do we have we have carpals ulna is the one which is towards your little finger so this is your little finger okay so yeah, i have if i have this arm my this bone is ulna this is my little finger so this will be my 
radius all right and then i have in the wrist here i have carpals and here i have metacarpals here okay and these in the fingers i have phalanges so how many phalanges are there total 14 so let's write their name in the forearm we have one humerus we have ulna we have radius then we have carpals we have carpals right so we have the eight carpals here fine we have eight carpals here and then we have five metacarpals and then we have in the fingers which are phalanges 14 so what's the uh, arrangement the arrangement is two three 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 that means in the thumb i will be having two bones and in the other fingers i will be having three three bones so two fingers in the thumb so here what is present are all the carpals uh, so this is how the carpals are arranged uh, the four and four in two rows okay so we have distribution these in the two rows these are all the names of the carpals if you love to learn them you can love learn, uh, learn them but if you don't want to i will not uh, you know suggest you to learn their names but still for those who are curious we have uh, different types of uh, here uh, what do you say carpals okay so it starts from scaphoid then lunate on the upper row and then we have trichotrum and pisiform. Okay. Then we have trapezium, trapezoid, capitate and ham hamet in the uh, row below. So this row is present near the arm. So this row is proximal. And this row is the distal row. All right. And then we have these metacarpals and then we have the phalanges. All right. So this was your forelimb. Let's talk about the hind limb okay so here we have hind limb so what are the bones in the hind limb first of all we have thigh bone which is femur one and then we have tibia one fibula one patella what is patella the kneecap which is again one and then we have tarsals metatarsals and phalanges okay let's write them how much are these tarsals we have seven metatarsals five and phalanges same 14 with the arrangement of two three three as same as in the four limb so let's see where they are present so here in the thigh we have this femur right <clears throat> okay something bad <laughs> so here the head of femur gets the attached to the point in your uh, bone that is your acetabulum this femur is forming joint one with the kneecap which is patella and then with the tibia but fibula is not forming any joint with the femur it is forming joint with the tibia only Fibula is a very thin bone as you can see and it is the one which is present towards little finger. If you have noticed the bone which have L in them, they are present towards little finger. L means little fingers in the fibula as well as in the ulna. Right? Ulna. Alright? Okay. Next we have tarsals, metatarsals and phalanges. Metatarsals and phalanges are same as the metacarpals and phalanges. Let's talk about the tarsals. So this is how the foot it looks like. So we have different different tarsals. Uh, we have talus, we have calcaneus, we have navicular and then these uh, tarsals which are cuboid, right? Which are these? These are cuboid. They have not written in the diagram, but your ma'am is there to tell you. So, all their name is cuboid. Okay. Which one? These one. These one are cuboid. Okay. The talus is the tallest part of the foot. The talus form the tallest part of foot. It is forming your ankle. What is the tallest part of your foot? Ankle. Okay. If I talk about calcaneus, it is forming the heel. You all know this is the heel portion. 
and navicular is present here so the only thing that you need to remember from tarsals is the talus and calcaneus which bone of your tarsal forms the heel simple calcaneus which bone of your uh, tarsals forms the ankle talus the tallest part of foot is ankle and that is formed by talus t for talus t for tallest all right next we have the very very important topic and that's joint you need to listen to me very carefully let's get started with joints what is a joint it's an articulation between two bones it is the articulation between two bones so we have three types of joint one is fibrous second is cartilage and third is synovial if i talk about the fibrous joint it is rich in white fibrous cartilage whenever two bones are joining they just can't join it straight away they need something to rest in between and that is your cartilage so every two bone when they are forming a joint in between them will be present a cartilage okay so here which cartilage is present white fibrous it is also known as fixed joint because it is completely fixed the bones do not move at all and you will find them in the skull suture of skull if you have seen that diagram of skull that i have shown you the image of skull that i have shown you you have seen here these lines in between skull bones these are sutures what are these these are sutures okay all right moving further to next next is a cartilaginous joint so cartilaginous joint is slightly movable joint it's slightly movable joint here you will find uh the white fibrous as well as the hyaline type of cartilage right so both type of cartilage are there hyaline and white fibrous so where do you find them you will find we have already discussed all of these intervertebral disc the one which is present between both the vertebrae pubic symphysis the present between two hip bones and then the third one costal cartilage right so that means here we have just written the points now we are going to talk about where are they present the intervertebral disc is present between two vertebrae so i'm writing v1 and v2 whereas pubic symphysis is present between two hip bones and your costal cartilage is present between sternum and rib now so this was the immovable the fixed or the fibrous this one was slightly movable and this is the highly movable joint so this joint you can see wherever you need more movement like your arms your knee your elbow right so here how this joint is formed we have two bones like this like this is bone 1 and this is bone 2 and you better know both the bones are joined to each other by ligaments we have discussed ligaments in the connective tissue right so a bone is attached to a bone this is bone via ligament via ligament so the nature has given you a protective covering on the ends of the bone the ends of long bones they are protected by a layer of cartilage the reason is if you have just kept the bone like this you have not covered it with anything all the calcium will come and the bone will keep on elongating right and this will restrict the movement of joint for example if i have two joints okay two bones okay let me just find something to explain okay so if i have two bones like this and they are uh, i just take a cello tape and you know wrap it around it the bo uh, the, the joint will not move if i keep a distance between these two now there is a space and these can easily move fine now what happen here is now what happen here is if somehow 
if somehow these two start to grow and they're going to fill the gap they're going to fill the gap will they, will they be e able to uh, give the proper restriction the uh, movement they will not be able to give the proper movement fine so here this is how it is so nature has uh, wrapped these bones with the articular cartilage so that no more calcium can bind to it if no more calcium can bind to it then no more growth of the bone will be there and the space will remain as such between the two bones right so this is articular cartilage so articular cartilage is a type of hyaline cartilage now these two bones are wrapped upon each other with the synovial membrane with the synovial membrane this synovial membrane secretes synovial fluid synovial fluid right okay so this is how your uh, joint uh, synovial joint it looks like so what are the various types of synovial joint let's see the first category we have is a ball and socket the ball and socket is a type of joint where one is forming a socket and a ball is getting fixed in them where do you find it you find it in the hip joint and shoulder joint because they both were on the same principle in the hip joint we have acetabulum attached to femur and in the shoulder we have the glenoid cavity fine then we have another category which is hinge joint what is a hinge it's a type of space between the door and the wall and uh, here the door moves in one direction the uh, uh, the wall is fixed right so where do you find this you find it in the knee joint or elbow joint then another example we have gliding joint gliding joint is a joint which is present in between the bones which have flat surfaces like your carpals like tarsals then we have saddle joint saddle joint is a poorly developed ball and socket joint so it was a joint that wanted to become a ball and socket in the future but it somehow was not able to so it gets sad similarly all your fingers are together and your thumb is you know alone so the carpal and metacarpal of thumb it shows the saddle joint so it's a poorly developed ball and socket so what's the example carpal and metacarpal of thumb all right next we have ellipsoidal ellipsoidal or condyloid joint is a joint in your body which allows the movement in these two directions like this okay so where were these these movement yes yes which was this which was this this was your atlanto occipital joint the joint between occipital and atlas okay so this was your uh, ellipsoidal or condyloid joint all right moving further to the next type of joint next we have the pivotal joint pivotal joint so what's a pivot here one bone is fixed and another is rotating around its axis like this if this is fixed and this is moving like this okay so this joint is formed in radius and ulna and also the same movement was there also between atlas and axis so it's the atlanto axial joint all right so this was all about your joints let's move further and do some questions which of the following is not a function of skeletal system locomotion production of erythrocytes storage of minerals production of body heat yes your skeletal system helps you to move it also helps in production of rbc why because it has bone 
marrow, red bone marrow. It stores mineral in the form of calcium phosphate and it does not produce any body heat. The body heat is uh, produced by your muscles, not by your skeletal system. So the answer is D. Next, which of the following joints would allow no movement? Ball and socket, fibrous, cartilaginous and synovial. The cartilaginous allow slight movement. Synovial is highly movable. Ball and socket is a type of synovial joint, but the fibrous was immovable or fixed joint. So just remember it by FIF. Fifth, fibrous, immovable, and fixed. So answer is B. Next, sliding filament theory can be best explained as when myofilaments slide past each other, myosin filaments shorten while actin do not shorten. When myofilaments slide past each other, actin filaments shorten while Myosin filament do not shorten. Actin and myosin shorten and slide past each other. Actin and myosin do not shorten but rather slide past each other. If you remember, while muscle contraction, I make you write some of the points where I have told you during maximum contraction, I band disappear, edge zone disappear, but A band remains constant. Also, at that point, I have also told you that the size of the myofilaments remains unchanged. They are only passing upon each other. They are sliding upon each other. So whatever point says they shorten, that's false. So it says myosin shortens, it's false. It again says this shortens, it's false. Both shorten false. So the answer is again D. All right. I hope that's pretty clear to everyone. Next. Glenoid cavity articulates. Articulates means it forms joint. Humerus with scapula, clavicle with the chromion, scapula with the chromion, clavicle with scapula. So we have made this triangular bone that scapula. So here is a depression known as glenoid cavity that fits here in which the head of a humerus gets fit. So glenoid cavity articulates humerus with the scapula. Answer A. Select the correct matching of the type of joint with example in human system. As I've told you, joints are quite important. So you just need to understand. Basically, you have to remember what type of a joint is formed in which uh, bone, right? So just remember that like cartilaginous joint, where is it present? Cartilaginous joint, you have to find the correct matching, right? So cartilaginous is not found in frontal and parietal. These are skull bones and they will be having fibrous or fixed joint. So this is incorrect. Pivot. It is present between third and fourth cervical vertebra. In between vertebra, we have intervertebral discs. So we have cartilaginous. Hinge joint between humerus and pectoral girdle. Hinge is present between these two bones like radius and your this humerus. So that's incorrect. Humerus and pectoral is forming ball and socket. It is talking about shoulder joint. Then gliding joint is between flat bones. It can be carpals, it can be tarsals. So answer is again D. Pivot is not formed between third and fourth cervical vertebra. Can you please uh, let me know which uh, vertebra is this? Yes, pivot between C1 and C2. Okay. Stimulation of a muscle fiber by motor neurons occurs at neuromuscular junction, transvestibule, myofibril, sarcoplasm, reticulum. So whenever motor neuron is stimulating a muscle, there is a junction present. And what is the name of a junction? Neuromuscular junction. It's quite simple. You know, these type of the questions where you don't need to get confused. These are straightforward. But whenever you read all the options, you actually get confused. Next. That's it. So this was it about the chapter locomotion and movement. This is quite simple and interesting chapter. What you have to do is the same thing as I always say. I uh, try to solve a lot of PYQs with you. But I'll suggest all of you to please solve these PYQ like past 10 years and read NCRT and solve a lot of questions and read the books, you know, every day and make good notes and revise them every day. This is the only key to learn biology. I'll meet you in the next class. Till then. Bye bye.